I trained as, uh, as, a, as an architect and now I'm sort of into property development um, and a bit of regeneration. Um, and I guess for the purpose of this conversation, I'm also a first time home buyer. Um, <laughs> I joined the, the, the debt that. club, so to, so, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but yeah, no, I'm really happy. I'm really grateful. Um, I thank God for the journey. We're, we're, we're actually shooting this video in his house as well. So yeah, yeah <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is our <laughs> conservatory. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice little space actually. Um, it works quite well. Um, when I was looking for the house, I had a few specs that I wanted to to try and tick. Um, obviously, that affected like budgets and sort of um, prices of property. But um, I think depending on your strategy and your taste, there's something there for everyone. So um, yeah, like keep keep learning. <laughs> yeah. So quick question. So you're an architect and uh, a lot of times people are like, why do you need an architect? Or would you say it's good to have an architect if you're looking for a house or when you get a house? What's your view on that? So I think um, architects are basically trained to solve problems. Um, they basically sort of out there to um, help people make decisions, spatial um, sort of decisions. If you want to have an extension or you want to have a new build or you want to convert your property into something else. Like there are so many things you can do with a property and I think an architect can help um, give you some ideas on how you can do it. And some legal advice as well, which is very important. Um, mm. You know, they can help you sort of get planning permissions, um, speak with building control, um, and sort of help you do all the legal things that is required for um, development. So I'd definitely say architects are useful okay. um, from that perspective. Yeah, they can guide you through the process as well. As well, okay. So now, um, before we get into too much detail, I think on a high level, um, if we touch on the journey, you know, so before you got this house, you were probably thinking, I want to get a house, which is what everyone dreams to do. Yeah. You know, um, I know in you guys' case, you're quite old. Obviously, yourself, you make a 25 homeowners. That's actually a big deal. Um, what would you say was the journey? What, what would you say the journey was like? You know, would you say it was straightforward? Was it what you thought it was before you went into it? Or was it slightly different? You know, so, so what's, your, what's your opinion on that? Um, so I think the journey was quite, there was a lot of anxiety involved in it mm. um, because it was new to us um, when you have to share personal details with like banks or lenders and um, other people that you ne I've never really had to do that before. Um, so I found that quite um, sort of nerve wracking really because they can see all my history of how I've sort of spent money and, you know, places that like my money would have gone to. So. You know, it was quite interesting to sort of go through that process and, you know, you're just there waiting for someone to basically say, yes, you pass this stage, i.e. You might, you might pass the credit check or mm. you, you might, you have met the criteria for the lenders and you have the available funds and mm -hmm. all the, all the stuff that's requested in the process. So. I think waiting to hear that um, feedback from to move on to the next stage, I felt was um, a bit nerve wracking. But now that I've done it, um, I think the important things that I've learned from it is you need to make sure you have good credit. Mm -hmm. um, I know that sort of said um, a lot, but it's really important. Not to say that there aren't lenders out there that will lend if you haven't got good credit. There are lenders. Um, we know some lenders as well um, that, you know, if anyone sort of needs that opportunity, we can sort of provide a bit of help and assistance. Um, but, yeah, credit was really important. Um, having the right funds to equate to the amount of deposit you're looking to put as well mm -hmm. so you can go in there to get an offer and say yeah yeah i've got 25 percent deposit i've got 25 percent deposit whatever um and then like it comes when you need to show proof of funds they ask you for it and you know if you haven't got that money you know you might need to get into another kind of conversation mm -hmm. with the lenders correct yeah so for example they might say like oh you need to write a comfort letter or something mm -hmm. that the rest of the funds is going to come from here and then that's going to happen so then they're going to request additional information. information this is true yeah um so i think 
just be prepared that what offer you actually put down on a property is something that you're prepared to actually you got to show them you have to what deliver you, you have to deliver yeah. yeah that's interesting yeah yeah so so you touched on something as well that I find pretty 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 interesting um obviously there's something they call um, agreement in principle you know and from experience I find that's pretty useful so to those of you who are looking to get into the property like that that might be your first stepping stone however if you think, oh, you don't have the best credit rating out there or you have a county court judgment against your name, that doesn't actually mean you wouldn't get the mortgage, you know, from research as well as some projects we sort of dealt with in the past. When I say projects, I'm not really into this full time, but I happen to know one or two people in that space. And um, what happens is there's a way they actually look into it quite detailed. So that shouldn't stop you from sort of getting onto the property ladder. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that's a very important point, the whole credit rating thing. Um, of course, now, it's one thing to say you want to get a house. It's another thing to say what type of house, where you want the house. A lot of people think, oh, and before I even go into that, something I'm, I, I tell a lot of people that sort of have been or well, helped on the property ladder is your first home doesn't have to be your dream home. No. Would you agree with that? You know, I mean, our first house... We didn't even live in it. It was a buy to rent, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the one up north, you know. So your first home does not have to be your your dream home. It could just be your stepping stone into that sort of model. So that's something I really emphasize on. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot more involved, so which we'll talk on later as well, is um, the way or what type of houses to go for in terms of houses with future proof. And then also the thing about flats as well. So that's that's quite a lot to talk about. So let me go a step back now. Um, what do you have to say about the first instance there? Um, so I think, well, there's a lot to sort of take from there um, yeah. in terms of what to look for in a property uh -huh. um, and sort of if you're thinking long term or if you're thinking you want to live in it and sort of rent out some um, rooms or you want to convert the whole place and split the title. So there's so many things you can do with a property. Um, in my in my situation, I wanted uh, a property that I could live in and that I can feel comfortable because I think that's very important if someone else wants to buy your property. If you feel comfortable in your own home, someone else should feel comfortable in that home. So there's also that sort of bargain into in the future. Um, so I think looking for a home that sort of meets the criteria. And I think it depends on the postcode and your affordability at the moment. Um, I think existing properties give you good spatial value um, that you can use for different things long term. Just, just, um, to, just to know, we're going to charge you for that comment, actually. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah, but go on. Free consultation. No, go on. But then you can sort of get flats which are sort of closer to stations, you know, that you can have as good rental properties in the future. So it depends on it depends on what you want. But I, I think if you can get a, a house that's close to a station that can get you to your destination within a good time mm. that you feel comfortable with, then I think that's a really good asset. Um, I think you can live further away. Um, the way London's designed is um, it's designed to go into London um, from different points. So it connects sort of straight um, from different points into central London, whether it be Victoria or London Bridge, as opposed to sort of round that way. That's um, the 25 Yeah. Okay. So the way London's connected is, is really weird. So it can take you like 30 minutes to get from Brixton to um, like London Bridge and the same 30 minutes to get from like Dartford to London Bridge via train. Mm -hmm. It's really so weird. That's very interesting actually. The, the way transport is set in London, everything goes inward. So you can afford to stay out further out in London and still get better value. Correct, um, yeah. I, I don't know if I'm sort of... No, I, I think that, that makes that perfect sense, yeah. you know. So, I mean, the way I'll put that in figures terms is, you know, you want to get a property in central London, which costs you like 600k for a one or two, one bedroom, yeah. you know, 600k, versus you getting a property outskirts of London for like 300 to 400k, yeah. you know, on bigger that, space. Um, yeah. Sorry, go on. Sorry, no, yeah, no, no the, the reason why I'm saying that is because, so for example, in Orpington, mm -hmm. um, you can get a direct train from Orpington to London Bridge in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And Orpington is like... Like it's far out. It's within the M25, but the, you can get houses there for like within three hundred to four hundred sort of thousand pounds for yeah. you know semi-detached or uh, end terraces or terrace houses. So if you can get the trains and your transport into work to work within an hour, 
Mm. Um, I think you can afford to live in all these other places Correct. and have benefit of, you know, having a home where you can have family if that's what you want or it can become sort of future investment. Correct. Yeah. Um, but when you're trapped in London, you're... You're confined to the restri- restrictions, I guess. Yeah. 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 Even and planning and permission and flats the and stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, on, the, on that note about flats, I am, I kick so badly. I, I, I don't... I don't like the idea of flats, actually. If you recall, at the very start of this journey, you did consider a flat, you know, yeah. and then we chatted <laughs> about it. And shout out to MK, actually, who is into property development as well. You know, he was like, that's actually not a good shout. Mm-hmm. So I obviously spoke to you about it and we thought about it and it's very true. You know, likewise, the one of the properties we have up north as well, you know, the, the thing, what do you say this charge? So you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a huge, huge rent. issue. Yeah, ground rent and so many other factors. And these are things people forget. You know, you think you have a flat and the rest. It's good, but, you know, again, it depends on what you want. Some of you are happy with the house for the rest of your life, one bedroom flat, central London. If that's you, fine. Um, for us, I know we're very... I mean, there, you know, there, there, there are benefits to that. It depends mm-hmm. on the type of development model you want. True. Because you have, like, lease options. Mm. You know, you can get a flat in central London, you know, where the lease has only got, like, I don't know, 15 or 20 years left Mm -hmm. so you can get it at a low value but you can also rent it out and sort of get that monthly income as well Mm -hmm. Um, so it depends on the type of development strategy that that, that you want so if people people I mean just just throwing out there I guess if people can reach you directly to sort of talk about the strategies in terms of you know leasehold freehold because I found that at the very start pretty confusing Mm -hmm. you know do you want to shed some light about what the whole idea is behind freehold and um, leasehold and the rest um, so I'm not an expert on this. I just, yeah. <laughs> I'm not thinking I'm an architect. Just, you just, know it all. I just, I just, <laughs> I'll help you as well. I, I know what it is, but yeah. Um, all I know in basic terms um, is freehold. You own the ground and everything within that. Um, and with leasehold, you kind of hold the section of that building of what it is, and you're basically renting it out long term. Mm. And there's sort of conditions with leases that says you can't do this, you can't do that depending on the type of property, if it's in a listed building, there might be lots of conditions, like you can't change the floor, you can't change the worktops and no structural movement Mm -hmm. as well. So there's a lot of conditions that make it tricky to adapt those spaces for different purposes. Mm -hmm. But with a house, because it's freehold, you more or less are in control of everything within your um, sort of title plan. Correct. Yeah. Um, so there's more opportunity and flexibility from my perspective because I'm an architect. I'm a I'm a designer. Mm. So you know, um, with a freehold house, you can look at extensions, um, permitted developments as well, which I've, I've helped a couple of people do those. Um, they're sort of three by six meter sort of extensions that you can get depending on detached or terraced. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get side extensions as well to add value. Um, a lot of people use pull out equity to That's recycle another, it yeah. mm-hmm. back into their property, make it bigger, um, adds more value, eventually could become a HMO, depending on if you've got the room sizes and the um, availability to do mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So I think in a nutshell, um, houses, if you can get a house, it's good to live in. You have the space mm-hmm. um, for future. You've got the flexibility, True. Um, the adaptability to do whatever you like with it. And at the end of the day, if you don't want it, you just sell it on. True. <laughs> Do you yeah, know what I mean? Um, and hopefully if you sell it at a good time, you can make a bit of profit. But. True. So so in, in the journey now, we've touched on obviously finding the house, um, the type of house in terms of how you want it to look. We've spoken briefly on the mortgage side of things. Now, just coming back to the aspect of a house, you know, I know you guys had some instances where you had challenges around your first property you did look at. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to talk about that? Because some of you might actually make that mistake. Um, you see a house you like <laughs> and you fail to think about certain things. So if you could just shed some light on that, if that's okay. Um, so there are two things, um, timber and concrete. Um, so now because of the whole Grenfell thing mm-hmm. that happened, a lot of lenders are a bit sceptical to give out loans on properties that are made out of timber. Not to say that timber isn't a good material. Um, I've used, I've worked with timber before. I think it's a beautiful construction material Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it does have some good fire qualities to it in terms of fire resistance Um, and it's I think good timber construction buildings are safe Mm -hmm. Um, but some lenders are a bit skeptical investing in timber construction properties yeah even new builds Um, I have friends that 
when they had their survey done by the lenders, they noticed that it was made out of timber and they wouldn't give the guy the, the funds. Yeah. So his case didn't quite go through. Um, in our situation, we looked at a property that was built out of um, reinforced concrete, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of like prefab, prefab sort of concrete walls and panels that mm. kind of form the sort of face of the of the house. Um, so a lot of these were built um, post-war. So they were sort of built um, sort of in 1940s onwards, 1950s. Yeah, maybe. that was probably the trend around the time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so these were like quick builds because mm-hmm. people needed housing. Um, this is when a lot of housing associations started um, see, okay. coming um, as well. Mm-hmm. So they were really quick to sort of fit. But the issue with that is um, they sort of started to crack over time. Mm. Um, because they weren't designed to absorb tolerance because ground moves. Um, So eventually, in long term, they end to like just sort of break. They shift, I see. Wow, okay. Whereas if you have like masonry with your bricks and that sort of, you've got the mortar joints that kind of absorb a bit of ground movement. Oh, really? I didn't know this, actually. So it's built up. It's like when you have Lego and you built it in different stacks, its rigidity is different as opposed to something that's just straight. That makes sense. So it depends on, so that's why most lenders would feel comfortable lending on masonry um, Mm. construction. So like your traditional bricks, your block works, um, because they're proven methods that Mm -hmm. that work and everyone Mm -hmm. knows that, you know, a bricklayer, you know, he knows what he's doing. Um, He he does the job. It's a craft that's tried, tested, and, you know, people do it for thousands of years, Mm -hmm. you know, working with brick. So... But now they're trying to introduce other materials and out there. So, um, yeah, so it was in, in our case, we, 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 we liked the property that had mm-hmm. the concrete. Um, the surveyors <clears throat> went out and they said, sorry, it's made out of concrete, even though we had um, it had sort of a brick cladding to the front of it. So the concrete was behind. So wow. in, in the pictures on right move, you won't see that. Yeah. Um, so be mindful of that. that Yes, the image might look good, um, but if the construction does not meet the lender's requirements, then um, you've got some issues there. You have issues now, that's if, true. If you've got a new, if you want to buy a new build, uh, my advice is make sure it's got NHBC warranty. Um, Sorry, can you just repeat that? NHBC. Yeah. Okay, NHBC. Guys, take note of that. Uh, NHBC warranty, and basically. These are um, details that the contractor would have had to follow in order to make sure that the building is um, sort of designing compliant, out, compliant mm-hmm. basically. Um, so like the window seal details to make sure when it rains, the water drops off properly and doesn't go into the building, the waterproofing line, the sort of wow. thermal insulation. Mm-hmm. So they have um, guys they send out through the process whilst it's getting built to check but mm-hmm. they're doing all these things. And then at the end, they issue an HBC certificate. Okay. Um, and then that warrants the building for tip about 10 years. Okay. That's really good to know. So if yeah. you know your building comes with that, then you know that they've gone through that rigorous due diligence to mm-hmm. make sure that the construction is sound. It's sound. Oh, that's very useful. Very useful. So guys, take note of that. You know, the whole thing about looking at pictures on all these websites for houses like Right Move and the rest of them. Um, you might see a picture, it might not be really what you think it is, you know, get the surveys to do their job because mm-hmm. um, that's really important. So we've come to this, you know, point around, <clears throat> obviously, we, like I said, the mortgage side, you know, you get the house. Now, um, you touched on this briefly at the very start, um, getting a house that's future proof, you know, what attracted you to this house? I know you're an architect and again, you know, I just want to inspire a few other people out there. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your what inspired you to get in this particular house? Was it um, obviously it's a lovely home and it's fantastic? Um, was it that or was it the long term? I can actually turn this into a two bedroom house or I can turn this into flats or I could you know what was the key selling factor if I could say? Oh, was it the train station which is literally mm-hmm. around the corner as well? What was the trigger? Yeah, I think it was a it was a factor of things actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. The, the transport is one. Mm. Um, the fact that it's a 10-minute walk to a train station, I think, is really good because mm-hmm. um, then you can go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Also, it's got the space and I can have a toilet downstairs. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, so if you're thinking long term, it's quite good to know that you can have a toilet downstairs because, you know, if you're not mobile and you want to sort of use the toilet, you can easily use that. So when we design properties, um, life, if you're designing a house for lifetime, um, it, the, one of the requirements is to have an adaptable um toilet or WC that you can have a shower and shower and the rest of okay. so that when you get old you have that mm -hmm. and then upstairs is for like kids and all that kind of thing as well okay um, drainage is important if you think oh I've got this house I'm going to have a, an extension the space is there mm -hmm. if there's a drain um, where you think you're going to put the extension um, you're going to have to do a diversion and you're going to have to get Thames water involved and that's as you in London it could be other yeah, yeah, it could, it could be, it yeah. could be anywhere. Yeah. Um, so just be mindful of where your drains and your manholes are and your gardens and stuff, because if you're going to build over that, you got to think about the legal um, restrictions. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So a number of factors in your case. So now, just I think we might be coming to the end of this video, video vlog we're doing. Um, but we're answering a few questions because I can see people typing on there and the phone's far. I didn't think about the distance, you know, in terms yeah. of getting both of us. So <laughs> apologies, it looks like that. But just one, one, one sort of final question on my part. Um, what was the longest journey in this process? And um, how long did it take you guys from the point of this is the house we want to accomplish on? So, oof, the, actually, the actual process of buying wasn't the hard bit. I think saving for the deposit was. Mm -hmm. And I think... What you can you can get five percent. Aha, that's a good point. You can get ten percent. You can get whatever percentage, but five is the minimum. So if you find a property you like, just know that all you have to have is good credit or okay credit, and five percent of that property. And if you have that money, more or less you can become a homeowner. But all the other little stuff that mm -hmm. you do, it's a nice journey actually because you learn as well as you as you as you go through it. Um, so I, I think, yeah, just finding means of um, saving that money is probably the, the, the tricky bit, part, but yeah. if it's doable, um, mm -hmm. you just have to, you know, my advice is don't, don't hope, um, think of money coming from different sources. Um, and just work towards it and just have faith as well. Mm, that's very true. Um, Mm -hmm. And once you have that, the process will just happen. Um, I think God will guide you through the through the journey. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's interesting. No, I because I, I, it's so funny. I remember when we were having this chat, and then the other day I came into your house. I was like, "Oh gosh, I'm in your house." You know, it, it, it's it's very inspiring and it, it's good. Um, you know how to make money off your first home property. So what what's your take on that? <laughs> how to make money on your first? Well, I don't. Right now, I don't know, yeah, because I've just owned for um, a little while now. Um, so I think the first thing is if you can add value to it, um, mm -hmm. then when you want to remortgage, you can have your property revalued. Mm -hmm. um, little ways to add values to your house is timber flooring. Um, in your kitchen, have tiles, splashback tiles. Um, those really help. I have good curtains as well. Um, mm, sort of interesting. curtains that have a bit of weight so when the valuer goes around the property and touches and feels things um, it, it makes it a bit more pleasant mm, mm -hmm. um, and sort of less tacky um, a cheap way of making a property look good is uh, change your your door knobs or your cabinet knobs um, you can go to B&Q you can buy cabinet knobs for like a pound, one pound fifty, two pounds. It's not bad, okay. And then tip, you can just unscrew the old ones and then just screw the new ones back in. Mm -hmm. And then that just gives it a little pop. Um, paint, you know, you can always just... And, and Touch up and the paint. rest. Okay. Yeah. But if you think of it as a, as, as a feel, things that feel good mm -hmm. um, have more value or they tend to have something a bit more to more. it. That's true. Okay. You know, so, yeah. No, that's actually really interesting. I didn't think about the curtains because I like old curtains. <laughs> so, <laughs> like in, in, in the house we live in currently, I have had those. I mean, I love those curtains, but they, you know, like everyone is like, change them, change. Even you as well, you're like, change them. They look the, old. The, 
you know, but to me, it's like, <laughs> mm-hmm. they look good. Oh, bless her. <laughs> so, is she online, actually? No, Probably. I don't think she is. Yeah, because she was driving. Anyway, so I guess that's about it. Um, thank you all for watching. Uh, it's been fun. Um, look out for my shout out next week, actually, just to introduce next week's topic. It's around social media and the hype around social media. Is it worth it? You know, because a lot of you guys reach out to me and you know, like not reach out to me per se, but I get a lot of people that stress so much about Instagram from the blue tick to so many things. Actually, what even triggered this was I had a chat inside in my DMs the other day, actually. <laughs> and it was like, um, hi, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, I can help you get to blue tick. And I was like, sure, feel free. You know, like, you, you know. And then the next thing, he messages me again. It will cost you a thousand five hundred pounds. And my mind, I was like, is it that important? Like, you know, I can use that money to generate a lot more things, you know. So long and short, when he did that, I just cracked up in my head. And then also, I remember the other day I was with uh, one of these social media influencers. We over like millions and millions of followers and we're conversing and I mistakenly said I don't see the importance of social media and he got defensive so I thought you know I'm going to invite an influencer as well someone who's got way over multi-million followers and we're going to discuss so look out for that next week um, again guys ask me questions reach out to Akin please tell them where you handle this um, it's Akin LC um, you can just find me on